Today's episode is brought to you by Curve, a card and digital wallet service. You'll be hearing more about Curve later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. I am joined by Chance Finucane, Chief Investment Officer of Oxbow Advisors. Chance, great to have you here. How are you doing? Great. Thanks for having me on the show, Jack. So we're recording uh, the afternoon of uh, November 21st, and a lot is going on. I feel like, Chance, this entire year, people have been talking about a recession, a recession, a slowdown, a slowdown. And that has materialized. Yes, we've had two like consecutive quarters of uh, negative real GDP, but it doesn't feel like the economy is slowing down as many had thought. What, what is your out, uh, outlook on just the general health of, of things? How are you seeing things? We see things slowing. Uh, I think a lot of people would agree that inflation likely peaked in June when it hit that 9% year-over-year number. But I guess maybe what was the head fake that uh, threw people off was those two quarters of negative GDP prints in the first half of this year. Technically, you could qualify that as a recession if it stays that way after future revisions. But that's not going to be really the typical recession experience that we've seen in decades past. We actually think that's more likely to occur sometime in 2023. And as much as there's been a slowdown in real GDP growth, uh, it's as much this hiking in interest rates uh, across the curve that we think has been a big reason for the drawdown in asset valuations in the equity market, bond market, and even starting to see that in commodity prices. And uh, how close do you think the U.S. economy is to a recession where the actual economy, it's not just growing at an extremely slow pace, but it's actually slowing down. It's definitely slowing down. It wouldn't surprise us if a recession started in the first quarter of next year. Uh, it's a decent possibility in our mind that the first two quarters of next year could see negative GDP, pr- GDP prints similar to the first two quarters of this year, but probably a little bit deeper negative prints uh, than what we experienced. And one data point we just noticed was the existing home sales number, which a lot of housing data tends to be more leading of an indicator. The existing home sales, whether you're looking at the absolute level it's fallen to or the year over year decline that we're seeing down about 30 percent year over year, that's pretty much exactly where you were heading into the start of the recession in December of 2007. And it's just interesting. You rarely see numbers get that far down and uh wouldn't surprise us after we get to the holidays if you start to see negative numbers. How severe is the slowdown in housing, and what would you say is the is the, is the cause? Is it just it's, it's things were so overvalued? No, there was no other. You know, every, everyone who wanted to buy a house had one. Is it the rise in interest rates? Rates would be a huge part of it, and then I'd imagine just the huge jump in prices that we had when rates were so low, and you had the Fed buying mortgage-backed securities, which brought down the volatility of those valuations. So you saw a compression in the difference in the 10-year treasury rate and the mortgage rate that people were able to get. So uh, I know a lot of friends who were able to buy their first homes for a 3% mortgage rate. I'm sure you do as well. And uh, that was a great time there for about a year or two. But now when you're jumping up to 7%, that really slows down the activity. And uh, some data we saw suggests that you would need either a 20 or 25% decline in home prices or a 300 basis point drop in the mortgage rate or a combination of the two to get back to a normal housing affordability level. Um, and it probably end up being a combination of those two, but it's going to take some time for that to play out. Right. So even though the price of housing has not fallen by that much, the uh, it's still extremely unaffordable just because prices remain very high and uh, mortgage rates are so much higher than, than they were just two years ago. Uh, Chance, where are you seeing that in the, the housing market? So we, every, pretty much, you know, we all know that the mortgage industry in terms of origination is has fallen off a cliff. Uh, in some cases, 50% refinancing even more so. But what about the home builders? What about just the, the absolute level of, of housing itself? Uh, where, you know, is it, is it possible that, yes, okay, the, the housing market has frozen, essentially, because no one wants to leave their homes, no one wants to move into a new home. But, you know, prices, you know, the prices, price declines are capped at, you know, 5 10%, as I've seen some Wall Street analysts say. Or, you know, uh, what's the, door number two is that, no, price declines are actually quite severe. How are you sort of thinking about things? Right now, it's pretty minor, and I think that's the difference now versus what we all experienced uh, 13, 15 years ago during the fallout of the housing bubble. You don't have as many people. They have a lot more equity in their homes, and there was a lot more uh, 
homeowners or people who are taking out mortgages that were able to afford those mortgages. So it seems like people right now are just staying put. And I'd imagine over time, though, you're going to have more situations, especially if you see the unemployment rate start to go up and people are going to be forced to move for a new job or they might have to relocate if they can't afford their current home, if they're uh, unfortunately lose their job. You might see more situations like that. And maybe once we start seeing more transactions, you'll see a new equilibrium level in home prices that are going to be a little bit further down than where you're seeing transactions right now. When we're talking about interest rate sectors of the economy, there's housing and then there's also automobiles. Uh, Have you been noticing anything going on in that sector? It does seem like a very difficult time for uh, used car prices coming back down. I just saw a headline that Carvana is down 97% from its peak. Kind of tells you where things are at compared to uh, when used car prices were so high. Uh, It's an area that I think you're going to continue to see weakness. Uh, Ally Financial is another company we track. Uh, They Most recent quarter they reported they were showing an increase in delinquencies. We think that's going to be a difficult area uh, through however long this potential recession lasts. And certainly from an investment standpoint, we're not trying to go anywhere near the auto sector at this time. Uh, We don't necessarily think it's a a great business to begin with to invest in, but especially not when you think you're heading into a recession. Yeah, I would would definitely share your view there. Uh, Chance, there are many different ways to measure it, but I think so ally financial delinquencies and just in general financial businesses of, of, of lending, uh, delinquencies are on the rise, but they're on the rise from essentially zero. So I think in the case of ally financial, the trend looks horrible, but delinquencies are actually still below 2019 levels. So how do you sort of think about that where the absolute level is actually okay, but just the rate of change, I mean, if you just extrapolate that line, it, it looks like it's headed in a pretty bad direction. And, and also, what does that say about the economy? Sure. I think you've kind of hit a, on both points. So absolute levels are low, but I think especially the way we look at investing, it's that rate of change number that matters probably even more to us because you're trying to figure out where things are heading over the next 6, 12, 18 months. And if you're starting to see that rate of change turn, especially after kind of going down for several years and now it's starting to perk back up. And if we think the economy is going to slow and you could see an increase in layoffs, that's all going to suggest that those delinquencies will keep going higher. You can't extrapolate that to some automatically high level, but as long as you're seeing that go in that direction, uh, we would expect there'd be more pain in the future. And if you're not seeing the valuations you want in that sector, then it wouldn't be a time to uh, to really get excited or try to do anything from an investment standpoint. So now that we have your macro outlook roughly framed out where business is slowing, but we're probably not in a recession yet, and we likely hit the peak of inflation, forward economic growth does not look too great. And by the way, that we've only talked about the US, global, we, we can get into that later. How does that shape your investment outlook? What are things that you think offer like attractive risk reward in anywhere, you know, stocks, bonds, sectors, uh, real estate, commodities, whatever. And then also what are things that you think, oh, wow, I want to get my clients away from from this run, not walk. Sure. So for us, we have three strategies for our clients, uh, depending on their situation. We have a conservative income strategy that just tries to invest in very safe uh, bonds, usually short-term treasuries or high-grade municipal bonds. And that's actually, I would say, the short-term treasuries is where we're seeing the best risk reward right now. It's been a long time since you could get a 4.5% yield with essentially no credit risk, no default risk. And compared to where we see equities now, uh, we don't see a lot of upside at these valuations. We're still more concerned with the downside. Beyond that, and our other strategies where we're trying to generate uh, more income for clients or in our equity portfolio, we're really focused on high quality businesses or asset classes that have clear visibility on their cash flows. So if you are an equity investor that has to be fully invested, uh, which we don't have that mandate. We keep a lot of liquidity during an environment like this. You really want to be focused on more defensive sectors that you think you have a lot of visibility that earnings and cash flow is going to be able to hold up. And for us, we'll look for advantaged businesses that have a history of being able to generate consistent cash flow uh, all the way through an economic cycle, including a recession. So businesses like that that uh, have done well for us this year would be like Visa, MasterCard or O'Reilly Auto Parts. Mm. Auto Parts, yeah, but that's that's t- okay. Like, let's get into the individual stocks. So when I hear Auto Parts, I think cars, but and cars are very economically sensitive. But O'Reilly Auto Parts is is uh, someone above the economic cycle. 
Well, there's a difference between auto parts and O'Reilly is the best run auto parts retailer. So actually, when you see a decline in uh, new car sales and used car sales, that means that uh, drivers around the world are keeping their current cars and it means they're going to have to fix them when things go wrong. And so the best description I ever saw from uh, another firm is that the auto parts retailers like O'Reilly or AutoZone, think of it like healthcare for cars. And they're going to be able to generate a lot of consistent cash flow. And it doesn't mean that their stock's going to automatically go up, but uh, they're typically going to be more immune, uh, especially compared to other retailers. It's interesting with the consumer discretionary sector, most of those businesses see a real drop off in consumer demand. But uh, Otto O'Reilly is one of those ones that uh, will be able to hold up through a cycle like this. Over the past decade, really decade and a half, companies that whose earnings power was able to grow during slowdowns and sort of be a quote secular grower those were the mega cap tech stocks the fang stocks facebook now called meta apple amazon google netflix is that still the case what do you think it's going to be interesting uh through this next 12 to 18 months i think that's the case uh maybe for a couple of them but the difference is the growth rates have slowed uh for these businesses so we had looked at this data going back to the last 15 years of bear markets or market corrections that we've experienced. It's about, about five or six different periods like this. And uh, companies like Alphabet and Microsoft outperformed the S&P 500 in every single one of those downturns. So it does tell you that there's a lot of consistent cash flow that's generated. Uh, right now, I think the reason why they're underperforming is one, the valuations that they were starting with this time around, I think were more excessive. So They've been coming down. The rising interest rate environment is a bit new. Uh, if you start to see long-term interest rates come down, I think they'll perform a bit better. But the last thing, especially in the digital advertising market, is if you look back at 2008 when Alphabet was able to grow right through, uh, even later bear markets when Facebook was around, it was able to grow right through uh, a difficult environment like that. The digital ad market was maybe 10%, 20% of total advertising Whereas now digital advertising is more than half of the advertising marketplace and advertising is going to move with uh, GDP growth. So if you're going to see nominal GDP coming down, then it's probably going to be a more difficult environment. And that's what we're seeing right now for, uh, for Alphabet, Meta and others within that social media space. So back in 2008, these things that were dependent on digital ad sales, they were like their own little pocket of the economy. But now they've grown so big, they are the economy. Exactly, exactly. And for Apple, I think it's holding up well, though uh, we imagine there might be some weakness in their earnings heading into next year just because they are still selling uh, consumer hardware products uh, that you might see a bit of a, a softness in demand, even though they're still getting some growth from their services business, although that's decelerating a bit as well. It's just when you become that large, it's going to be hard to uh, keep that secular growth running at the same pace it had in years past. How are you thinking about the financials sector? Everyone says, you know, if you watch the uh, financial networks, when interest rates are rising, you got to buy those banks. But if we're headed to a recession, you know, banks may not be the call. What do you think? Yeah, the thing that I think gets missed is usually if you have rising interest rates, uh, that's a sign of an improving economy and rates are going up because you have nominal and real GDP growth increasing. But if you're heading into a recession and exactly what we're dealing with right now, when you have an inverted yield curve, that's the wrong environment for banks uh, that want to be able to pay a, a low short-term rate on deposits and then be able to lend at a higher longer-term rate. And that's not the environment they have right now. Uh, the other thing that I think they might be dealing with over the next year or two is even though they're much better capitalized than they were in 2008, they are dealing with a lot of unrealized losses on their loan books, the mortgages, things like that that I think they're saying they're just going to let it run to maturity and that allows them to avoid having to realize those losses through their income statement. But if something ever forces their hand to have to realize some of those losses, that might hurt their capital ratios and force them to have to raise equity or do other things that wouldn't be in the best interest of shareholders. So historically, I think we've tried to stay away from the banks just because they're more of a trade than a long-term uh, opportunity. And we try to have a little bit more of a longer-term outlook with our equity portfolio. And when you're dealing with that much financial leverage and the fluctuations in an economic cycle, there's usually better ways to get that exposure without all that uh, leverage that you're taking on by owning a bank. Mm. Right. And I think those unrealized losses on treasuries as well as mortgage-backed securities, I think it is 
easily in the hundreds of billions. I mean, maybe up to half a trillion. Uh, now it's, it's it's quite extreme. Chance, what? So what? What do you like? I'm I'm throwing a few things at you, and it sounds like uh, not a lot is passing passing the test. <laughs> There's not a lot right now. Uh, I mean, I mentioned the short-term treasuries example for the conservative investor in the high income strategy that we run, where we're really trying to beat the bond market and trying to get about a mid-single digit uh, yield for that portfolio holder through dividends and coupons. Uh, Beyond short-term treasuries, we also like some of the uh, big bank preferred stocks. We do think that because these companies are managed more conservatively, their preferred shares that pay out a six or six and a half percent dividend, uh, we think those are actually a decent place to be. Uh, we also still have some exposure to energy and uh, MLP, specifically the pipeline businesses, uh, for those income shareholders, just because with the amount of cash flow they can generate when oil is sitting at $80 a barrel, even if oil falls to $60 a barrel, they're still going to be able to generate good cash flow. And we think those management teams are doing a better and better job of returning that cash flow to shareholders. So that's been a a good place to be for the last couple of years. And then on the equity side, it's really been a focus on preserving capital. Uh, We've probably have a net invested position uh, of about 40% in those accounts. Uh, We're probably about half invested uh, in a little more than a dozen companies that we've owned for years. And then we have a small position in an inverse S&P 500 ETF just to uh, balance out against the positions that we don't want to realize uh, those gains for taxable uh, clients in their portfolios. But really, it's more just trying to manage this whole downturn for as long as it takes before we start seeing signs that we want to be more aggressive and adding exposure again to the portfolios. So you said that in your equity portfolio, you're about 40% in stocks, 60% in cash or bonds. That is a very conservative position. And uh, based on what you've said now, as well as, well as when I um, interviewed uh, Ted, Ted Oakley in the summer, uh, Oxbow has been well positioned uh, for this year on a relative basis, given that you've sort of been overweight cash. So that's, that's your firm specifically. But Chance, what I hear, and this kind of confuses me, and that's a polite way to put it, is that, oh, the stock market has to go up. Why? Because everyone is underweight. You know, there's these AI, AAII polls of bulls versus bears, and everyone is saying that most investment advisors were as prudent as, as Oxbow, is that, you know, oh, investment managers are record underweight stocks. My, but I'm like, if everyone's record underweight stocks, how come we're still, you know, within within the all-time highs, close to, you know, 20% of the all-time highs? Um so yeah, I know I sort of threw a pretty a lot at you, and it was kind of a confused thought. But do you think others? Do you think it's accurate that others in the investment business are as sort of conservative as you? Because the, the thinking is, oh, if everyone has already sold, there's no one left to sell. I don't think I, the vast majority of of other funds out there are nearly as conservative as we are. Uh, just because I used to work at a, a firm like this, and I think most mutual funds and ETFs have a mandate to essentially be fully invested. And when you see those numbers like record amount of cash for equity money managers, that means that the cash level has gone to five or 6%. It's not that it's gone to 20 or 30 or 40. Uh, and we understand the mandate for, for those funds and why they run it that way. But that would suggest to us that uh, they still are invested in a lot of these uh, sort of popular stocks of the last decade or um, for whatever it is, they're sitting in stocks somewhere out there across all these sectors. And I think everyone's kind of waiting to see if they've gotten through this period where, okay, the Fed will stop raising rates. Maybe they pivot and start cutting rates and everything will be fine. But in our estimation, the next thing or the next thing that's going to happen will be the drop in earnings guidance uh, going into next year. And we actually saw some good data that just looks at previous recessionary bear markets. And it's usually this next six months, probably from here through about May, that uh, you're going to start to see an acceleration in earnings downgrades. And investors are usually waiting for company management teams to actually say that explicitly in earnings calls. They're not going to do it themselves. So even though we're starting to see a bit of uh, negative revisions in earnings expected for the first half of next year, we think it will be uh, an acceleration going into the rest of 2023. And what did you make of the most recent uh, th- third quarter earnings reports where companies released how much of the money they made or didn't make in the third quarter 
as well as, as you said, the guidance, the forward guidance, name of this podcast, of how much money they and how much money they're going to spend in the next quarter, as well as even in perhaps 2023. So it sounds like you think that it's going to slow down from here. But what was your estimation of what you saw in Q3? Was it slowing down just as much as you thought? Or was it, you know, kind of earnings were resilient? Well, when you get to the actual earnings that's being reported, uh, by then, usually company management teams have talked their way down to a number that the majority of them are going to be able to beat whatever that earnings expectation is. So they reported 4% year-over-year earnings growth across all the S&P 500 companies. And that looks okay, considering that was about what was expected. But you only had to go back six months earlier, and analysts were expecting 10% year-over-year growth for the third quarter. So it's not surprising to us that you missed by that much versus what was expected six months ago, but it's usually those looking out six, 12 months uh, and seeing what's baked in and kind of realizing that it's probably too optimistic. So what's interesting to us is that over the next three quarters through the second quarter of 2023, that's already flattened out to where uh, analysts are pretty much expecting flat growth. And they're even only expecting 1% revenue growth in the second quarter next year even with nominal uh, GDP growth, probably going to still be three to 5%. So shows you that things are starting to slow. What we notice is in the second half of next year, uh, it's still double digit earnings growth that's expected. And that just doesn't quite fit for us that we think that's going to be able to hold up. But I think that's just the short term nature of uh, street analysts where they're really only looking out a couple of quarters at a time. So er revenues are supposed to grow 1%, but earnings are supposed to grow 10%. And uh, for, so what I've seen is in the second quarter of next year, second quarter of 2023, you're looking at 1% revenue growth, more or less, and basically flat to down 1% earnings per share growth in the second quarter. But I did see, a, I just extrapolated and, and figured out what the second half uh, earnings per share guidance is that's embedded. If you look at the full year uh, earnings per share for the S&P 500, and if you're assuming flat growth, for the first half, you're still expecting, it looks like between six and 9% earnings per share growth for the full year 2023. So that means you're expecting anywhere from 10 to 15% EPS growth uh, for S&P 500 companies, which we just don't quite see how it's gonna get there, but maybe no one's looked out that far yet to realize those numbers have to come down. Hey there, I hope you're enjoying today's show. Just wanted to let you know that this episode is sponsored by Curve, a payment service that gives you power over your finances. The way it works is that Curve is an extra layer on top of your credit and debit cards that gives you additional cash back on the rewards that you're already earning. Curve Card has no foreign transaction fees and you can choose to earn your rewards in crypto. You don't have to, but you have the option. Curve Card also has a feature called Go Back in Time where you can retroactively change the card used to buy an item after you made the purchase, up to 30 days after actually. A key concept in finance is optionality. When you have the option to do something, but you don't have to do something, this can be very valuable in finance as well as life. And optionality is exactly what Curve gives you to do with your wallet. So check out Curve to get $20 once you've downloaded the app and made your first transaction. Curve Card is powered by Hatch Bank. Terms and conditions apply. Now let's get back to the interview. How high do you think the, the Federal Reserve uh, goes? The, the terminal rate now is priced for about 5% in spring. Does that sound about, about right to you? Or do you think the Fed goes higher or you, you think they don't get there? That seems about right to us. I think the thing that's more interesting is once they get there, how long does it stay at that level? Uh, it wouldn't surprise us if inflation falls to about 4 to 5% uh, by the middle of next year, but then stays there or stays in that range longer than people think. And if you're going to have CPI around that level, uh, and then you look at other statistics that try to strip out the extreme uh, components of inflation. So whether you're looking at the sticky CPI or the median CPI number, uh, things along those lines or the core, um, core inflation numbers, those are all still looking pretty extended. And I think Chairman Powell is looking for that to get down below 4%. But if you're still staying in that 4 to 5% range, it's going to be difficult for him to take any action. If we have uh, an economic slowdown or a recession kicking in, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be on him to decide whether he wants to cut rates. And then you might see an acceleration in inflation and everyone will have to pivot their portfolios accordingly. Or that recession might get deeper in nature if he has to keep rates high because inflation hasn't gotten down to the level that he wants. 
Chance, what are your clients saying in terms of how are they viewing the market? We've noticed a few things. First, uh, it was interesting in March of 2020, I think the effect of people just in general thinking about their health of their financial, their finances, their portfolios, that happens when time is dragged out and you have more time to see that your asset values are coming down. You look at it more often. When we had the pandemic hit, that was only a month long and everyone's concern, understandably, was much more with their actual health and the health of their families rather than with their portfolios. So while we had some inquiries about how things were going, it bottomed and then started going back up so fast that really it wasn't like a typical recession like you might have seen from 07 to 09 or even during the dot-com bubble. So I think this time people are actually more uh, attuned to what's happening in their portfolios than they were in 2020 because we've already had 10 months of this. And then I think it's also just a reminder for everyone in general that these sorts of multi-year recessionary bear markets can play out. It's just been more than a decade since we've had the last one. So reminding people that we can stay patient, walking through that the valuations aren't where we want them to be yet, and just saying we don't have to jump back in. The final point about this that I think is different, and uh, we've gotten calls and inquiries about this, is it's been a long time since we've had a short-term treasury rate of over 4%, and especially when it got to 4.5%. And when it hit 4.5%, we noticed a lot more interest uh, from people who just say, I, I can take 4.5% and remove a little bit of risk. And especially when you compare it to the deposit rate you might be getting at a bank, uh, we've definitely seen that with more assets moving away from banks where you're not getting much of a return and you can put it in some sort of a short-term treasury that gives you a much better yield. Yes. And going back to our earlier point about how some, some investment managers have a, a larger percentage of cash, it actually is appropriate to have a larger percentage in cash when you're getting 4.5%, basically 5% as compared to zero. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we made a conscious point as rates on the short end have been going up to move the vast majority of our liquidity into various short-term treasuries just to ensure that there's yield being provided there rather than just sitting in a money market fund that's still giving you very little yield. Chance, in the world of fixed income, there's treasuries, but then there's also investment-grade bonds, high-yield bonds. How are you thinking about there? Are you seeing opportunities? Right now, our focus is mainly just on the treasury market and then maybe some uh, high quality municipal bonds, but the corporate bond space, whether it's investment grade or high yield, uh, we usually wait until you see spreads widen between the yield for any sort of corporate bond versus the treasury market. And if you look back in history in for the high yield market, you're probably looking at somewhere between a, a 600 or 700 basis point spread between uh, high yield bonds and uh, the equivalent maturity of a treasury bond. And then for the investment grade corporate bond market, probably more like 250 to 300 basis point gap. And we're just not there yet on either of those. Uh, I think one thing that we were looking at back when uh, the 10-year treasury rate was closer to 3%, we were thinking, well, you wouldn't even think about uh, investing in a high yield bond until you saw a 10% uh, yield, basically a 700 basis point spread. But we're still sitting at, what, around 450 uh, basis point today. So you've got uh, some room to go. And I think that suggests to us that there's more capitulation uh, that still needs to set in uh, on the part of investors across all asset classes before you get those opportunities. Hmm. So Chance, uh, last time I spoke from someone from, from Oxbow was in September. I spoke, I spoke to Ted and Ted was quite bearish at that time. And I know you, know, you and Ted have, have slightly different views, but you know, there, to the extent that there is sort of an, an Oxbow view, is, are you more bearish uh, than you were in September or equally bearish or less bearish? It's probably the same or even maybe even a little bit more bearish since we've had this rally in the last month. Uh, Ted and I may speak a little bit differently, but our view is one and the same in terms of how the portfolios are run. Uh, so from our perspective, we see uh, you know, an equity market that's trading at above 17 times earnings with uh, an earnings number in that P.E. ratio that we think is still too high. And uh, if we're looking for more of a bottom or an end to this bear market, uh, you're usually going to trade at a cheaper valuation and, and the earnings need to come down a bit from what expectations are still a bit too lofty. Uh, and then on the same side, in the income space, well, right now we think treasuries are the best place to be. But when we see spreads widen, then we'll get more opportunities to uh, invest in other types of bonds and in 
uh, other asset classes, whether it's uh, you know, convertible securities or other preferred stocks or even some common stocks that have uh, high dividend yields, but right now probably are not at the valuations that we want them to be at yet. What would a valuation uh, be at such, such that you feel like you'd be get, getting compensated for the risk? And you know, let's just say the 10-year treasury is about 4%. So that's basically a price-to-earnings ratio of 25. And then so the S&P 500, that's a price-to-earnings ratio of 17, which sounds good. And it's even better because S&P 500 earnings grow. Uh, at least they normally do, not, not if you're in a recession. Uh, but of course, stocks are way riskier. So you have to be compensated for that. You're saying 17, still too expensive. What would be a, a cheap enough for you uh, in a price to earnings ratio? Which, which by the way, for, for people listening, is um, just how much companies are making relative to, to what the stock cost. Yeah, just for historical perspective, 16 to 17 times earnings is the average uh, for the S&P 500 if you look back 25 or 30 years. So if you think the earnings growth uh, forecast for the market is pretty good, then paying average might be okay. And you can find a few names that are trading at an undervalued level that you're confident in the growth. It's different right now because you're trading at an average valuation, but the earnings growth and the economic growth forecast is slowing and getting worse, which is why we're hesitant to put a lot more cash uh, and liquidity to work. So typically you're looking at probably 14 times earnings and below. Uh, in a recessionary bear market, it's bottomed at as low as 11 to 13 times. So typically when you start seeing something like that happen, you're going to see more of a capitulation uh, that sends it more to those levels. And you're going to see that earnings number. Uh, right now, I think we're still sitting at around $240 per share in earnings uh, estimated for the S&P 500 next year. That's probably got to start drifting its way lower towards about $200 per share. And uh, when you get a combination of those, uh, probably somewhere in the low 3000s in the S&P 500 would be when we'd start getting more intrigued and start seeing more opportunities that we like. Right. So you said 16 to 17 price to earnings ratio is median or average over the past 25 to 30 years. I'm going to take a guess that if you extend it to the past 50 or even 60 years to the 1970s, that the average price to earnings ratio goes way lower. And so when inflation is persistently high and, and interest rates and treasury bond yields are persistently high as well, the, the, the bar gets even higher. So you sort of, you know, maybe even get some single digit price to earnings ratios. Uh, is this forecast that, you, that you, your estimation of price to earnings ratio, is that based on inflation returning to 2%? And if it is, if, if, if let's say the new, the new 2% is 4% for inflation, um, does, that, does that change things for, for valuations and why? It could. If inflation, inflation and interest rates stay higher than yeah, that would end up being uh, an issue that is going to be factored into valuations. It was even like in the 90s and early 2000s, the average inflation rate was closer to 3%. So our historical data points that we use include some of that time horizon uh, that you had that sort of mid single digit uh, price to earnings ratio. So it's possible you stay in that range. But if inflation starts to average out in that sort of higher level, then you're going to end up needing to uh, to factor that in and probably accept some lower valuations and need an even deeper discount to what the historical valuations were before you'd want to move and, and start buying things. When I spoke to Ted in September, I said, okay, Ted, you love short-term treasuries. What about going out farther on the duration curve to get a 10-year treasury, maybe even a 30-year treasury? And if I recall correctly, he said, nah, uh, that's you know we want to stick short-term. In hindsight, that was a great call because you had a huge a continued sell-off in treasuries, even though they've rebounded a bit over the past month. What do you think now? I mean, if we're about to enter a recession, my word's not yours, uh, the 10-year treasury historically is a good thing to own. It is. Uh, definitely during a recession, you'll usually see the 10-year treasury yield come down by about 150 basis points. I think this year has thrown people off a bit just with rising rates, and it's taken a bit longer for maybe those conditions to develop where you start to see long-term yields come down. At Oxbow, we do have a small exposure to long-term treasury yields. Uh, but primarily, we're still on the short end uh, of the treasury curve in our exposure. If we started to see a real change in trend where we really believe that that uh, more longer term fall through a recession in the 10 and 30 year treasury yield has started to take hold, which maybe that's starting to be the case right now uh, with where things are at. But when we start to really see that, I think we will try to have more exposure to the long treasury curve. But uh, at this time, I think it's still a bit difficult to say uh, if they're going to keep rising along with these increased uh, in short-term rates as the Fed keeps raising the Fed funds rate. 
thanks for that chance for your sort of overall asset allocation. Now let's get into individual sectors and if, if you feel comfortable, individual stocks. So I remember earlier I was throwing a few sectors at you and you kind of politely declined all of them as as uh, not good to own. What what do you like in in the stock market? You you mentioned, I guess, some financial technology companies like uh, MasterCard, Visa, stuff like that, uh, the, the uh, O'Reilly Auto Parts. What else is uh, attracted to you at this stage? Yeah, I'd say those are the best places that uh, at Oxford that we have in our equity portfolios this time where you're just trying to preserve uh, the returns that you've made over the last three years from 2019 through 2021. And it's a difficult period because the areas that, if this is the environment we're in, that will hold up best tend to be pretty fairly valued right now. We wouldn't necessarily say that O'Reilly or Visa or MasterCard are super cheap at the moment, but they do have the right characteristics that we think they're going to be able to hold their earnings and their cash flows. A couple of other businesses that we've owned for years and we've kept, uh, but uh, we've trimmed the positions this year are Adobe and ServiceNow. Uh, And those are software businesses that, unlike a lot of software as a services businesses today that generate zero free cash flow, these are two companies that are still growing at a decent pace and have very high free cash flow margins. And it's been a difficult year for them with rising interest rates, uh, but we've still kept a small position. Uh, right now, I would say that if we have a continued increase in interest rates, it might still be a little bit of a difficult time for them, but uh, they'll be able to grow through this whole period and then coming out of whatever sort of difficult economic conditions that we deal with next year, they should be able to accelerate their growth and continue to generate lots of free cash flow. Yeah, as someone who works with people and is kind of tangential to the video business, Adobe does have a moat. Okay, so Chance, so there are companies that have been able to pass on costs to consumers. This year, they've been able to do that. And it sounds like you like the companies that have been able to do that, but will be able to do that in the future. What are the sort of companies that, yes, they've been able to pass the costs on to consumers this year, but you think next year will just hit a wall because people will not have enough money to buy things and they will either be, they cannot raise, raise past costs onto consumers. And, you know, this is just my opinion. I'm, I'm not saying that this is true or anything, but an example would be Chipotle where, okay, you can raise the, the cost of Rito from $12 to $15, but you can't raise it from 15 to 20. There's just that you're going to hit a wall. So what sort of companies there? You have any thought there? Yeah, I'd say anything that would fit in that consumer discretionary category. Uh, and if we're really trying to narrow it down, uh, businesses that are not, the Walmart target example last week is perfect. Walmart, uh, everybody loved their earnings report. They're talking about uh, households that have over $100,000 in income. They're gaining market share there as those households are starting to spend more at Walmart. Whereas at Target, they're seeing continued deterioration in their profit margins. They're trying to get rid of inventory uh, that's been sitting on the shelves as best they can. But it's almost unfair as a comparison because Target is a true discretionary retailer. They're not a grocery store, whereas Walmart, people go for their groceries and then they might add some other general merchandise on top of that. So anything on that consumer discretionary side, we would expect to see continued growth uh, in spending through the holidays. But then after that, Uh, we saw a number that the increase in credit card balances, uh, this has been the fastest increase in credit card balances uh, year over year, going back more than 20 years. And at some point, people are going to be tapped out on being able to use their credit cards, the savings rates at a very low level. And when they get done spending whatever excess savings they had from stimulus payments in 2020 and 2021, it's going to be difficult for them to be able to spend on anything that's not an essential. So whether that's consumer durables like cars or boats or uh, projects you might have around your house or uh, anything on the discretionary side like apparel, electronics is really struggling. We'll see what Best Buy's next earnings report looks like, but well-run business, but just going to be a very difficult time for them as an example. So you are not constructive on consumption. Like the the biggest, I think, in the the, um, consumer discretionary ETF is Amazon, Target, stuff like that, and Tesla. Um, so that is not something that you uh, think will do well. We don't think so. Uh, it's just typically consumer discretionary is one of the first areas to peak and start going down when you see this sort of slowdown in growth. And they'll be one of the first sectors to bottom and start going up as soon as there's possibilities of uh, a trough in consumer activity and then an increase. But for right now, you're right in the middle of this period that you'd rather be more in consumer staples or in staple type businesses within consumer discretionary like that O'Reilly Auto Parts example, 
rather than a true discretionary purchase uh, type company. Okay, so I I, I think you may not look at it in terms of a sector. You don't you don't start with the sectors. I think you do like fundamental analysis. But if I had to ask you, which are maybe the top three or four sectors that you you like now as investments? I feel like if I if I propose a sector to you, I feel like it's you're you know you you don't like a whole lot now. But um, yeah, what 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 are we, what sectors do you think are, are best to invest in now? What we would say is, and it actually, I think our portfolio is structured a little bit differently because we're not we don't have to be fully invested. And mm-hmm. if we think the best place to be is short-term treasuries that generate a 4.5% yield, then uh, at Oxbow, we'll sit in those uh, securities instead. But if you're running a fully invested account or needed to be fully invested in this environment, it's your typical defensive areas. It's consumer staples and healthcare. Um, And then you you might want to get some exposure to utilities if you see long-term bond yields come down. And the final area that uh, might be intriguing, but it's really an interesting uh, sector to follow right now is energy, since oil prices are falling substantially. And yet, uh, if you look at XLE, the, the price of XLE is staying up near its highs. But I used to specialize in uh, covering the consumer staples sector. That's an area where you want to look at the price to earnings ratios of those companies relative to the price to earnings ratio of the overall market. And you want to buy when the relative price to earnings is at a discount versus what it historically trades at. The problem is right now, there's been a a real push to try and hide in those sectors. And so there's not a lot of companies like that. Uh, One of the few that we see that we used to own, but we sold for executional issues uh, is Unilever. But those are the types of businesses that are left uh, that might still look cheap, but you're going to have to deal with some executional problems or some aspects of their business. Like for them, they have a lot of exposure to emerging markets, which it's not a great environment when the U.S. dollar is uh, appreciating in value versus all of those emerging currencies. And how many bargains are you seeing out there? You know, Coca-Cola, a, a staple pun not intended in the consumer staples ETF. That's you know that that's in a bull market now. It's it's Coca-Cola will do well in a recession, but everyone knows that, and that's why the stock has gone up this year. What what are some some bargains you're seeing where you know some stocks have been really uh, you know, in the technology, any in the technology rubble, uh, sort of stocks where they, they're down ninety percent, or sounds like sounds like no. Anything that's down ninety percent is probably a business that doesn't fit our criteria. Our focus mm-hmm. is really on generating a lot of free cash flow, uh, having a solid balance sheet, and being able to consistently generate that growth uh, through a cycle. So anything that's down ninety percent or more, whether that's a Peloton or a Carvana, that's not going to meet our criteria. So out of companies that we do think are undervalued that we still own that we've had for years, you've got that Adobe and ServiceNow examples. We do still own uh, an alphabet position that uh, we've trimmed over the course of the year, but we still have uh, ownership there. When you hit the lows in the market uh, a month and a half or two months ago, we were seeing more of our stocks like Visa and MasterCard and Microsoft that were undervalued. But given this recent rise, we would say those are closer to fairly valued at this time. It's it's been great having you on. I want to ask you just about energy. You mentioned pipelines. Are you more interested in the pipeline business than, let's say, exploration and production or sort of actually getting it out of the ground? Uh, And if so, why? Pipelines uh, have less volatility to the overall oil cycle since their contracts are more based off volumes uh, that are just coming through. And even though their share prices will move a bit based off of the oil price and how investors feel, whether they're optimistic or pessimistic about that sector, there's less volatility. And yet the consistency of their cash flows, with most of that being returned through a dividend to shareholders, is valuable for any uh, anyone that's looking for a consistent high dividend. So that's the reason why that's the majority of our exposure to the energy sector. And then what we'll end up doing is at stretches that we start to feel really positive uh, about the oil sector, we will add some of those uh, exploration and production uh, type companies, but those definitely are going to be more volatile and those are more uh, intermediate term trades for us rather than long term holdings. Uh, that makes sense. So it sounds like cash is king. Cash or short term treasuries, I guess you would say, uh, if cash isn't yielding much. But right now, I think it really pays to just continue to stay patient, monitoring everything closely. And uh, there will be a great opportunity that comes out of this, but it's been a long time since we've had. A potential multi-year recession and bear market only twice in the last 25 years. And uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's interesting coming in every day and, and following all this, but we're going to wait for a, a really fat pitch and a great opportunity. Yeah. 
Chance, so you said that Oxbow does three different strategies for clients. What is the wrapper there? Is it mutual funds, separately managed accounts, ETFs? Tell us, and you know, how can people find out more about Oxbow? Sure. Uh, the accounts that we manage are, are separate. Uh, you know, each client individually. We don't run a mutual fund. And the three strategies: we have a conservative income account, a high income account that's meant to generate good yields and beat the bond market. And then an equity portfolio uh, that's supposed to generate long-term uh, growth. And really, it's just a, a conversation with each client to figure out what's the right combination uh, for their needs. So if you are interested in learning more about us at Oxbow, you can go to our website at oxbowadvisors.com or our media teams that a great job building out our YouTube channel if you search for Oxbow Advisors at YouTube. There we go. Chance, final question. Do you do anything, uh, do you invest at all in private equity or venture capital? We do not. We just stick with our own in-house research looking for uh, great individual public securities. Well, Chance, it's been a great having you on. Uh, thanks so much. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Thanks. Thank you so much for watching. A few housekeeping items before I let you go. Subscribe to the BlockWorks Macro YouTube channel so you don't miss another episode of Forward Guidance. Uh, you can find Forward Guidance, the podcast you just listened to, on your favorite podcast app. That's Apple Podcast, Spotify, Overcast, Podbean. Uh, that's Podbean as in, on this pod, I've been saying that the Fed pivot is still far away. In addition, please check out today's sponsor. It really helps the show. Link is in the description. Thanks for watching.